with the power of your word. Amen. Please be seated. For the last four or five weeks, we have been following the story of Abraham and Sarah and their family in our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, from the Old Testament. The lectionary gives us the high points of this family story, although we missed out a particularly important one that in the Jewish tradition is referred to as the binding of Isaac because we substituted an Independence Day reading on that particular Sunday. Nevertheless, we will continue hearing about Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Esau, Jacob, Rachel, and Joseph until the middle of August. So this would be a good time to go back and read this whole family saga as it appears in Genesis chapters 12 through 45, which, despite the disparity in those numbers, really won't take too long. Now, of course, there are some of those crazy Old Testament names and place names that may mean nothing to you or you may find difficult to pronounce, and even some lists of genealogies, but hang in there. Because reading this story of the patriarchs and matriarchs is akin to reading your own personal family story. And this story describes a lot about human nature and relationships and the way that our ancestors in the faith learned what it was to be in relationship with God, even when they weren't good or faithful or wise. There are many times as we read this account that we can probably find ourselves in the nub of the story, if not in the details, and their words and actions and attitudes may shine a light on our own actions and thoughts. So give it a try. Genesis chapters 12 through 45, and read a modern translation. The New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, the Message, the Common English Bible, whatever you like. The King James Version, of course, is beautiful, but it would waddy the mutters, would muddy the waters. (laughs) See what I mean? It would muddy the waters far too much. And some of the language has actually changed, not just the the sound of it, but the actual meaning. So stick with a modern translation. This morning, we have heard the story of Esau and Jacob, the fraternal twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah, different as night and day. And each parent chose one of them as their favorite. We know right away there's trouble coming. Jacob was the younger twin, and he was always the striver, the supplanter. That's what Jacob's name means, the one who grasps the heel. He was always trying to best his elder brother. And in this very compact story, we learn that Jacob does indeed cheat Esau out of his birthright, his inheritance rights, the two-thirds of his father's wealth that belonged to the elder son, as opposed to the one-third that went to the younger son. Now, does that mean Jacob got it all, the two-thirds and the one-third, or he got the two-thirds and Esau got the one-third? I don't know, but it wasn't good. Jacob knew how to manipulate his brother's weakness, physical hunger and a lack of being able to focus on anything else when he was hungry. I can only imagine that his blood sugar was plummeting, and some of you who are susceptible to that will know that really you can't focus on anything else. So Jacob knew how to manipulate his brother's weakness. And although it will not be a part of our Sunday readings in the next couple of weeks, Jacob cheats Esau not once, but twice, conning his brother not only, conning not only his brother, but also his father, when Isaac was on his deathbed and ready to pass on to his eldest son 
the blessing of Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. It was that unique and sacred blessing that Isaac had received from his father Abraham, the blessing that God had promised him if he and his family would pull up stakes and follow him and give to God all his trust and loyalty. Of course, this stealing of the blessing opens up a huge rift between the brothers and will lead Jacob to flee from his brother's murderous rage once he realizes that both his birthright and his blessing have been stolen from him. Can you blame him? And yet, God blesses Jacob. The line and the story and the blessing continue through Jacob's branch of the family far more than through Esau's. In fact, Esau's story kind of peters out. Now, why is that? If we were going to take a straightforward moralistic approach to this saga, we would expect that eventually Jacob would be brought up short and the birthright and the blessing would be returned to Esau, or at least to his descendants, and that Jacob would be punished or at least chastised and all would be well and right in the ancient land of Canaan. But that is not what happens. Jacob does get his comeuppance in a number of different ways. Particularly, he doesn't get to marry the girl he wants to, at least not right away. But that does not change the fact that he is the one who carries the blessing and who passes along to his children and their descendants the knowledge and the love of God in a way that seems to defy the world's wisdom. One thing we can say about Jacob is that he was singularly focused on obtaining God's blessing, even when his methods were unwholesome. He was the one who cared about it, who valued it far more than Esau did, to Jacob, that blessing and everything that went with it, including serving God in a focused and intentional way, was of ultimate importance. Maybe that pushed aside all other considerations, and God determined that despite Jacob's sins and shortcomings, he had what it took to be the bearer of the blessing to the next generation, and to plant that seed in his children and his children's children. Jesus had a lot to say about seeds to an audience whose very life depended on knowing how to sow and tend and harvest. The parable that we heard this morning, in which Jesus compared the kingdom of God to a farmer sowing a seed, sowing a field, Jesus describes seeds that fall in all different kinds of soil and situations. Fertile soil, rocky soil, a field of thorns and brambles, a hard-packed pathway. And each of these different soils produced a different result for the seeds that fell in them. Because we need to remember, Jesus is not describing here someone carefully going along, planting seed by seed, road by row. Instead, he's talking about a farmer who takes a handful of seed and scatters it into a plowed field or wherever the seeds fall. So each of these different soils produce a different result for the seeds that fall in them. Perhaps, despite his trickster nature, Jacob was like that fertile soil where faithfulness and loyalty to God could grow and flourish, even though he was not perfect, even though Jacob would stumble and fail God again and again. I think this should give us all comfort and confidence because none of us is perfect. None of us follows God without fail or without stumbling. Now, that doesn't mean we should take Jacob's deceit as license to misbehave. But it does mean that God's purposes are so much bigger than whether or not we always follow the rules. 
Sometimes following Jesus is about seeing the bigger picture, the deeper truth, about being willing to risk that God's love and blessing will sometimes move out beyond the norms, the accepted norms of behavior, and beyond the status quo. Following Jesus can take us to some pretty strange and unfamiliar places by some quite convoluted paths where the only landmark we have is the summary of the law that Jesus gave us. It's that part where he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think Jacob knew the first part of that, and he eventually learned the second part. And aren't our lives like that? We keep learning as we go along. But we'll never get anywhere if we don't keep the first part front and center. Love God, and then let God order our hearts, minds, lives, and actions. And never fear when we truly turn our life and our will and our love over to God, we will be remade and shaped and guided to be the person to be the people, all of us, that God wants us to be. The blessing was given by God to Abraham and was carried to Isaac and then to Jacob and then given to Joseph and on and on and on. We are descendants of this family, heirs of this lineage. Let us each receive the blessing that Jacob strove for, and use it to our utmost for God's glory and for the good of all God's people. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have planted the seed of faith and blessing in each of us. Let us tend it with focus, care, and love, so that we may be able to pass it to others when the time is right always trusting in your goodness and mercy. Amen.